Can you hear me now? <clears throat> All right, so um, I think these are your, uh, her notes. Tom, you up there, buddy? All right, let's put the buckets up there. Uh, so <clears throat> part of having a plan, and this actually goes into budgeting too, is understanding that we all have certain money that goes into what I call standard of living and then standard of giving. And so on the standard of living, again, this kind of goes into budget, but we're, we're zeroing in on that. It's part of a plan and budget is you have a certain amount of money that just goes to consumption. And that's living expenses, mortgage, rent, car, food, utilities. Then another one that goes to contingency. It can't all be consumed because of the contingency. Retirement funding, college, vacation, insurance, emergency fund. Those are the contingency dollars. And then charity. Now, ideally, I would like you to start with charity and work your way back because charity should be the ultimate goal to put there and then the next amount into contingency and then what's left over we will consume because if you start with the left bucket what happens is this and you all know I'm right you never get to the next two buckets you consume it all and so part of your job here today is to get motivated to lower the consumption bucket so that you can fill up contingency and charity more. But again, you have to eat that elephant one bite at a time, but you also have to be motivated. If, get this, if you never get beyond the consumption bucket... You will never in your entire life know what it means to do anything but to live paycheck to paycheck. And nothing wrong with that. Not belittling anyone. I've been there a lot of years. And many people have no choice in the circumstances they're in right now. But five years from now, or 10 or 20, there is a choice. Everyone has a choice. You may have been through a divorce or something put you in a situation where right now every dollar has to go to consumption. Believe me, I have a lot of heart for you and I am only there to cheer you up, not put you down. But even you have the ability someday, because I've seen hundreds and thousands of people do it, move to where you're beyond that. But for a while that might be where you're at. But with a plan, you can move to bucket two and bucket three. Without a plan, you probably never will. So let's go to the next slide. Budget rules. That leads right into budgeting. So <clears throat> let's go back to the four-letter word, time. It takes time to budget. Most of us don't budget not because we don't know how. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the how. But we don't budget because it takes time. And remember, your family finances, Wallace family and Smith family, Plasier family, Parker family, is a business. You take time to do your business. At Beacon Capital Management, the firm I started about 20 years ago now, there's a five-day work week. Now, our radio and TV and that runs on the weekends, but all that is pre-taped. So I do very little weekend work other than this kind of work, which is really just volunteer and service. I don't do this for money. But I do work Monday through Friday in a business that is a for-profit business. Now, every appointment and meeting that I can have a prospective family, and we have six other advisors and a staff member uh, 
crew of maybe, I don't know, 15, 16, 18. There's close to 25 of us, three different offices, opening two new ones next year. We have a lot of activity in our office, people coming in constantly. And the more people we see who are prospective people to invest money in whatever, then the better our business grows. But guess what? We take 20% of our week, one day, for planning. And we only do activity four days a week. People call the office, I need to see Pete. I want to see Pete on Friday. Nope, can't see Pete on Friday. That's his planning day. Nobody interferes with our planning day. We'll see clients Monday through Thursday. We plan for 20% of our week. Most people and businesses fail because they won't plan 2% of our week. But we need one more appointment. We got to work harder, harder, harder. How about working smarter, smarter, smarter? Huh? How about that? You're going to get more done in four days because it was planned out than you are in five days if you're just going by the seat of your pants and trying to work harder. It's like the guy chopping the tree and he just keeps pounding the tree with a dull axe and he won't even take a few minutes to sharpen the axe. He'd be further ahead taking some time out and sharpening the axe. Am I right? So budgeting takes time. Everyone in this room has some kind of a clue how to do a budget. What we don't give to it is time. So our family meeting is for budgeting, but it has to really be done as we go along. It's got to be done and, and looked at, and it, you can't just put it in place and say, oh, the numbers work out beautifully. Isn't that great? We'll revisit that at the end of the year and see how that worked for us. No, weekly, monthly, all the time. You got to think about that. And a budget is important. We think it restricts our freedom. It actually gives us more freedom. Because of a budget, I have freedom, financial freedom. And it came because of a budget. And so it's very, very important that you have a spending plan. If your outgo exceeds your income, then your upkeep will be your downfall. You can't spend more, well, you can for a while, but here's a very, very important point, okay? So here's the next most important thing you'll get out of this. But seriously, if anyone is within an arm's length of a pen, you can't afford to not write this down because this is key. Just because you can buy something doesn't mean you can afford it. See, here's the problem with our society and culture today. We can buy things that we can't afford. Back when my parents, in the little village of Seal Cove Fishing Village, Grand Manan with 500 people in it, back when they were brought up, and some of you here in this room have at least close to as much gray in your hair as I do. And so you remember the day that you didn't buy anything until you had the what? Money. What a novel idea. So you didn't buy things that you couldn't afford because you looked and said, we don't have the money. We're going to somehow do without it. One of the biggest things that gets people into problem and trouble financially is buying things you can't afford. And here's another thing that's very, very important. 95% of the people in this room are living above your means. If it's a typical room, and I bet it is. And only 5% of us, because I'm one of them, is living below your means. I could buy a much nicer car than I have. I could buy a much nicer house than I have. I could have all kinds of things that I don't have, but I choose to live below my means, even though for many of you, you would think that I live way above my means if you saw some of those things, but I don't. And I'm not saying that to brag. I'm telling you that as 
a, a goal to aspire to. Because most people, what we're told is that we can spend a dollar twenty-two for every dollar that we make and get away with it for seven to ten years before it catches up with us. Because all we're doing is, you ever see that game whack-a-mole? And there's all the, and you got this little club in your hand, and, and the mole comes up, and you hit this one, and another one comes up over here, and you hit this one, another one, and then you hit this. That's what we're doing with our money, and until we can't chase the moles anymore, we keep that pace up. And we keep buying things and paying for things, or buying things, not paying for them, things that we can't afford because we can. I mean, we. You know, we just borrow. And so you've got to have a budget. A budget helps you decide how you are going to spend your monthly allotment of income. And I know it's tough in a fishing village. Very tough. She grew up in that. For 63 years, her dad was a lobster fisherman. For 45 years, my dad was in the fishing business. First 25 years, he was a lobster fisherman. Next 25 years, he actually... Uh, was a, a boat captain for Connors Brothers Herring Factory. Anyone hear of that? It's over in New Brunswick. I don't know whether you have it here. Anyone eat a sardine before here in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia? That's what we lived on because Dad could get them for free. So in the herring business. Now, this is a side note, and there's no extra cost for this. Any people in here from Matagan? What about Tiverton? Nobody? They probably heard Pete Benson was coming because when, when I was in college at Kingswood, one of the guys on Graham and Ann decided to kind of take me under his wing. He wasn't a Christian guy or anything, but he knew I was studying at a Christian college. And so the jobs back then in 1978 and 9 on a seining boat were prime. There was a captain and five people that were part of the crew. He had himself as the captain and four others, and people were lined up as long as this gym is to be that next person. And some of them had great experience, and he passed them all by, reached out to me. I have a feeling it was because we prayed a lot. Seriously. That God would provide a miracle for us. And we believed it and prayed it and he did. And he stepped in front of all those people and put Pete Benson, who had never worked on a seining boat in my entire life, and got sick fishing to begin with, seasickness, and said, you can be my fifth crew member. And I seined on that boat, not having to... I was the, does anyone know anything about seiners? So I was the the guy who did the tow boat on the back, and so they would bring the net around. Well, I tell you all that to say this. We came over in your waters, and we robbed your fish. <laughs> Still think nice of me, please. I had nothing. I was just a lowly crew member, number six on the totem pole. But we would come over here seining, so we would leave on Sunday night and then go back on Friday night and we were up in Scotts Bay, Margaretsville, Digby, Matagan, Tiverton, Yarmouth. I spent two summers all around here. And we saning guys from Graham and Ann, all but me, were crazy. I mean, they were crazy. And they were bad. And the men of Tiverton and Matagan didn't like us very much. And they had every reason not to like us very much. I mean, there were brawlers and tough people, drunks on those boats that would come in. And so I remember one night after a long day of fishing, we would come in and we would tie up and we would sleep during the day and you go seining at night because... The light drives the fish to bottom, but then they come up at night. And so we fish from 7 o'clock at night to 7 o'clock in the morning, come in and tie up. 
And there'd been a little bit of trouble at the wharf in Matagan with some of the locals, and they threw rocks at us and our boat, and we actually had to anchor offshore and try to sleep that day. They wouldn't let us tie up the boat. They had every reason to do so. But I say all that to say, you have no idea what you're going to make when you're fishing. You can hope, but it is tough to budget. But every situation has an opportunity, and that's really something that you almost have to get one-on-one help with. If you're in that situation, and I would, I can't be that guy, but I would really encourage you, if that's a struggle for you, to get help. There are people in this area that also do finances for a living that can help you with that. But for all of us, there are two sources that I recommend you write down that are the best I know in helping us with budgeting and tracking. Because it's one thing to write the budget, and this isn't something I normally do because these people already have it done well. So if you want to write this name down, Joe, J-O-E, that's his first name. Last name, Sangle, S-A-N as in Nancy, G-L, Joe Sangle. The name of his company or operation or books is, I once was broke and now I'm not. I love that. That's pretty cool. So, Tom, you up there, buddy? Did you fall asleep on me yet? If you have the internet, can you Google Joe Sangle Budget? See if it pops up. Guys, we didn't try this beforehand, so say a prayer. He says he sees it, but I don't see it on the screen yet. So while we're looking for that one, write this down. Dave Ramsey. He goes to the same church I do. His office is just down the road from mine, but now he's building a massive office building. Dave Ramsey, read everything you can on his stuff. But this is, this is free. Joe Sangle has more free stuff that you never have to attend a Pete Benson seminar ever again. Seriously. Free stuff. I get his newsletter. Every, all kinds of stuff. So he's given you... The, the way to set up a budget. Let's look at this. So you first write down your income, all the different categories of places that income comes into your life, and then planned what you would hope, so that's your estimate, and then what was actual, and then what was the difference. But let's scroll down, Tom. You got income, and then you... I love this, because he starts with giving. What are you going to give... Decide that first and then live on the rest. Then savings, and there's different categories. You can get this too, so you don't, we can go through this fast. Housing, so these are all the things. I mean, he hasn't, down south, we got to have a bug man, okay? We have bugs in our houses. Shoot. So then transportation, gasoline, cars, insurance, miscellaneous, oil change, food, dining out, groceries. Clothing, children and adults. Oh, I hate that he put this in here. Credit cards, student loan, furniture. Scratch that. You should never pay anything but cash for furniture. Go up, keep on going. Debt, health insurance. So we got those down south. Uh, vacation, income tax. Shoot, there's a lot of categories. No wonder we're all trying to just get by. And so that's, that's, oh, so that's free. Why do I need to give you one? I just gave you one. Joe Sangle, I once was broke and now I'm not. All of his resources. You can go on there and there's so much free information. It would be like a master's degree college course at no charge. I love his stuff. Dave Ramsey, his is called Every Dollar. He has a budget and then a tracking plan. It's called Every Dollar. Dave Ramsey does have a lot of free stuff on his resources, but he does charge more than Joe Sangle does. A lot of his stuff that Joe Sangle gives for free, and free is is the price right when it's free. I like that. Because that's dollars spent that can go somewhere else instead of 
But both of those places. But let's look at the next thing, Tom. Uh, so this is where you want to get to. Now, don't beat yourself up if you're not there yet. But where you want to get is to at least 10% of the money that comes into your household goes to God if you're a believer. 10% is to retirement. Do you know what life's biggest expense is? It's not your home. It's not health insurance. It's not food. It's not gas. You're saying, kids. No, it's not your kids. It's retirement. The money to retire with dignity. Do you know that retirement isn't for a lot of people three to five or five to seven years anymore? And you take a couple of trips, read a book, sit down on the front porch, rock in the rocking chair for a day and then die? That's what retirement used to be. Now I have clients that have been retired into their fourth decade. And they're not, they didn't retire when they were 20. So retirement and then emergency fund, and then live on 75%. You say, Pete, I can't live on 100%. In fact, I can't even live on 120%. You want me to live on 75%? Yeah. I'm not expecting you to get there tomorrow. It might take a few years, but everyone can get there, I think, if they work hard enough and employ all the principles that I have and please take those books at the back. If you didn't bring any money with me, it with you, just, just take it. This whole seminar and then some that you're hearing today, nobody's allowed to leave. AJ, brace the back door, don't let them leave. The whole information that I'm giving you, don't stop taking notes, because there's a lot of stuff here in between, is in that book. I basically condensed my... Saturday seminar to a book called From Failure, you now know what the failure was, to financial freedom. All the steps that we're covering here today are in there, but this is in one of them. So you got a standard of living and then hopefully the standard of giving. So that's a good financial budget. So you've got to have a budget. Next. So debt. You need to control debt. This is the budget killer. Going into debt. So I'm going to start off with very, very important. Write this down. There's been a lot of those today. There'll be a lot more. Never go into debt for a depreciating item. Depreciating. Anyone? Where's our high schooler? He probably knows. Anyone know what depreciating means? going down. You go into debt, which means that you've chosen to pay more than it's worth for something that's immediately going to be worth less than it's worth. I mean, if a Martian came from Mars and we told him, this is how we do our finances here on planet Earth, do you think they would laugh at us? Seriously. But we've bought into this, and I'm telling you, you've got to reject it. Reject that maxim or axiom or principle that you pay more for something that you know is going to be worth less a month, six months, or a year from now. One of the biggest keys to my financial success is deciding that I was not going, we decided that we were not going to go into debt on depreciating items anymore. Now, it might take you a year, three, five, seven to get beyond that. But if you make it one of your goals now, everyone in here can do that. Now, I'd like to be 100% debt free for all of us, but... I am not near as concerned about going into debt for an appreciating item because as you pay it down, you owe less on something that's worth more. Does that make more sense? 
The problem is there's very few things in life that you buy that is appreciating. One, the church. I believe in the church. I believe in the church. And hey, if you're not a pastor here, I'm sitting beside you. Because I don't pastor a church now. I just sit in the congregation with all the lay people. I'm one of you, but I believe in the church. And I've never been disappointed with an investment in the church. It's an appreciating item that changes lives and families' direction forever. The second thing is homes. Now, it's not a guarantee that every home that you buy is going to appreciate. But over time, for well over a century, in most parts of North America, if bought correctly the first time, And buying a home that you can actually afford to buy, not just that the mortgage broker tells you that you can afford this. See, the problem is we buy things based on a payment. Stop it. Forever and ever, amen, stop it. You never buy the value of something by a payment that you can pay. Never. Car, house, furniture, which we all decided here today, never ever in the history of our life and family and our great-grandchildren and forevermore is anyone ever going to buy furniture on credit. But houses in most places, most of the time, if you buy what you can truly afford, not just what Somebody tells you, oh, you can pay this kind of payment because it represents this amount of your salary and they figure out all these things and they just want to upsell you. And I'm not saying that because if any realtors or mortgage people in here that I'm finding fault with you, that's just the way as a business a lot of times it works is, you know, that's how they're trained is it's on a payment. That's how people buy cars on a payment amount. Never buy on a payment amount ever, 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 ever again. It's like down in the States, believe me, and I know you know this already, we ain't got it all figured out. Most of the time, watch what we do and do opposite, okay? I, I'm... In March of next year, I'll be 60. It's like I've spent the first 30 years of my life in Canada, the last 30 years of my life in the U.S. And uh, there's a lot of things that I like about where I live and the U.S. There's a lot of things I don't like. But we have this strange tradition down there that after Thanksgiving, which is a Thursday in November, on Friday it's called what? Does anyone know? Black Friday. Do you have it up here too? Tell me you don't have it up here. We never had it when I left 30 years ago. What happened to you people? (laughs) Oh, you go there. So, Black Friday. It's like my wife and I, just for the kick out of it, we, we have not been arrested as one of those people going in the store but we're, we'll be there early on Friday morning for Black Friday. And we just like to watch people and watch the craziness and the chaos. But it's like you arrive on Black Friday and something costs $100 normally. And they say, because it's Black Friday, today it's $75. Sound good so far? But because... We're going to ask you to pay on this kind of a card. Guess what? Congratulations. You get to pay $1.25 for this item that you thought was $75. You actually pay $125. How do you like the sounds of that? How many people would buy that $100 item on sale for $75 knowing that they're actually paying $125? It's like if you... Here's how we end Black Friday. We be truthful 
with the shoppers and we tell them as they're coming in the door, we got great surprises for you here today. Everything is going to be 25% more than it normally is. We would run the other direction, right? But we do it every day. We do it every day. And it gets us in debt. The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. How many of you like to be a servant to the lender? It's not a pretty place to be. And materialism is the problem. Let's just cut to the chase. We are a materialistic society, and we love stuff. And stuff is shiny, and it gets our attention And we buy things we can't afford with money we don't have to impress people who couldn't care less. They're not impressed. We thought they were going to be all impressed. They were not impressed and now we're stuck with it. So, how do you pay cash for cars? That's right, there you go. I'm going to teach you how to pay cash for cars. Because when I was was, uh, 25 years old, and my wifey was 25 years old, and we already had three children, but we stopped there, seven grandchildren today, 25 years old, broke, but didn't know anything. We came out of college. Did I tell you we came out of college and never owed anybody, including the college, a red cent? And I have two words for you. Only God. He is a God of miracles. We didn't do everything right financially then. As I was learning, we stumbled and made a lot of big errors. But we came out of there debt free. And then we went to... Anyone ever been to Prince Edward Island? I start... We started... I'm not always used to you being here. This is... Did I tell you the backbone... I put my name on the books, but she could write them. I just, she lets me be the upfront piece. So 1984, I go to Prince Edward Island to start a new Wesleyan church. Island Wesleyan Church, if you've ever passed through crapo PEI. I mean, come on. Did, did the district hate me that much? Crapo PEI. We went to crapo. To start a new church. Family of five. Just got out of college. Man, we were filthy rich. And the district could afford to pay we church planters a lot of money. So what I did need is a car. To get around to visit people and to do church and get from our home to the church and all that. And so I went up to Scotiabank. And said... With my hand held out, I need a new car. And what they tell me is that we need to come see you. So they sat down, asked me a bunch of financial questions. Try not to blurt out laughing at me when I told them my income. And they would actually give me in 1984 $2,400 as a loan for a car. And back then you could buy a decent car for $2,400. So I take the papers that they gave me and I go home. Hadn't bought the car yet. Go home and I started reading over the fine print of what they had told me was part of the loan if I borrowed the $2,400 and paid them. And in 1984, interest rates were high. They weren't as low as they were today. And I started figuring out what I learned and realized is that at the end of the term, I was going to pay $3,500 for a $2,400 car. But it wouldn't be a $2,400 car because in essence, when I drive it off the lot, even if it's not a new car, it's not worth $2,400. It's probably worth $1,800 before too many months down the road. So Pete Benson, congratulations, you financial guru. You get to buy a $1,800 car for $3,500. And this is how much you're going to pay to Scotiabank. Nothing wrong with Scotiabank. They're a lending agency. It was all above board. They're great people, all that. But I looked at my wife and I said, we're not going to do this. 
She said, well, you can't walk. And I'm like, we're going to buy a car. So we went over to the sofa and pulled out the couch cushions and see if there was any quarters down in there. We started looking in every corner of the house, and eventually we did find $800 that we could pay cash for a car. And so I said, this is how we're going to buy a car. We're going to find a car, and we're going to pray first that God will provide for us a car for $800. And there was an older couple in the area that had a 12-year-old car that uh, they were uh, selling because they were going down to one car because they were older and didn't need both cars anymore. And so they were, pay- they were selling this gem, and I could buy it for $800, and here's a picture of that car. It's called the duck car. It was an AMC orange hornet with a white roof. Anyone ever see one of those? You remember? AMC hornet, baby. 12 years old, 800 bucks. It it doesn't show it right there, but it was actually painted with a paintbrush on the side. (laughs) The orange. But it was paid for. But they didn't have those stickers back then. Don't laugh. It's paid for. But here's what I did. I bought that car. And I laid hands on it many, many times and prayed because I'm not mechanical. And I seriously, I believe this. God allowed that car to last for two years somehow. And during that two years, you know what I did? I paid us the car payment that I would have paid the Bank of Nova Scotia every stinking month. And I put it into a car fund to buy the next car so I could upgrade from an $800 car and I had the cash to do that. But what did I tell you? The interest was high and so if you owed the bank, they got the interest, but what if I put the money into the bank every month? They paid me interest. So they were going to help me. They were going to put some of their money in with my money I saved up for two years to buy a car better than I would have been able to because they paid me interest. Now, not a trick question. Would you rather pay interest or be paid interest? Be paid interest. And so at the end of the two... uh, Okay, so I'll make this quick. So I'm driving from Summerside PEI to Crapo... And I knew that the car was on its last leg, and I get by Borden. You know where that is? Back then, there was no fixed length, so we had to take uh, ferries. And so I'm driving down back to Crapo, and all of a sudden, the car starts sputtering, and the steam starts coming out of the engine. And this thing was power steering. Seriously, really power steering. All the power you could. And then when the engine started to shut off, it was really difficult. And I got it off to the side of the road, looked around the car. And back then, of course, we didn't have many assets that were worth anything. So there wasn't anything in the car worth taking. And I left the keys in the ignition and walked out. And back then, it was safe. And I got about 100 feet in front of the car and put my thumb out and thumbed a ride home to Crapo. I went into the house, and Ginny said, well, I didn't hear the car come in. I'm like, no, I walked up the lane, Shearwood Forest, that's what the name of the subdivision was, and walked in and said, where's the yellow pages? Any of you less than 40 years old? They had these big, thick books that were phone books, and they were yellow pages. And I looked in there, and there was a place that would come tow your vehicle away, and it didn't cost you anything because they used it for parts if you just let them tow it away. Not a word of a lie. When I thumbed a ride back to Shearwood Forest and into our home, I never went back to the car. I just left it on the side of the road. And it was the bargain of the century for them to tow it away and not have to cost me anything to just be gone. And that car went to the junkyard, hopefully, and then we upgraded to a new car because we saved about $200 a month for 24 months plus the interest the bank had, and I could upgrade to about a $3,000 car now 
and pay cash for that. And since that day in 1984, we've always paid cash for cars. And you can too. But, you, but, but if you're like most people, you won't. Don't say can't. This is where it gets hard. It's won't. You know why? We have pride. I have pride too. I fight it every stinking day of my life. I got plenty. But what will people think? You used to have that really two-year-old, you know, very new car, and now you're driving this junker. You see, having money eventually means you got to swallow your pride big time for a while. And you got to live below your means. Could you go get a new car? Yeah. But should you? No. One of my friends, he's not a real good friend, but he's a good friend. I mean, we're not, we don't talk every day, but he's a guy by the name of David Bach, B-A-C-H. And uh, he's a financial guru. He's been on the uh, Oprah Winfrey show six times. He's been on the Today Show over a hundred times. He's written the book, The Automatic Millionaire, How Smart Couples Finish Rich, and many others, the nine times bestseller. And uh, he's spoken to my clients in Franklin, Tennessee, just a few months ago, 175 of my clients. He came to be a keynote speaker. We work in some, uh, some of the same um, groups together. So I see him several times a year. This was an article that he just put out uh, in October the 11th, 2018. Is that fairly recent? Self-made millionaire. Buying a new car is the single worth financial decision you'll ever make. Buying a new car. Some of you will disagree with me. You'll disagree with him. You can disagree and be wrong if you want to. <laughs> and I don't mean this with, if you know my heart, you know that I, I come up here to help you, not to brag on myself. But I can pay cash for any car, literally, that's out there in the marketplace, new, and I never do. Never. Never, never, never. It's not the way to get the most bang for your buck. It just isn't. So you can disagree, but the worst thing you can do is buy a new car and have payments on it. If I can, as a 25-year-old, single, at the time, wage earner of the family, on a church planter's salary begin to pay cash for cars for the rest of my life, so can you. And you say, oh, well, it's really easy for you right now. Yeah, but for the first 20 years, it was tough. But you can too. Now, you can't just start tomorrow if you have a car that, you know, you, this, this takes a little bit of planning. See, I didn't have something I was already paying on and everything to get out of, so... I'm telling you, don't beat yourself up over, well, I can't do that right now, so I can't do that. No, all of this stuff you got to ease into. What do you do? You have your family business meeting, and you start working on it. So because, and here's the fun part, because I was willing, we were willing, because it's a team. you got to get on the same page. Financially, to pay cash for cars and live below our means, even when, man, it was tough. You know what we get to do now? And again, know my heart, not here to brag. I didn't have to drive all this way and come to Yarmouth just to, but I know my own story better than everybody else's, and I know what God did. How many times can I say that? God did with simple people that were sold out and prayed and just tried to be obedient, the amazing things we get to do today weren't even in the conversation of anyone that I even knew back then. And so show the next picture. It doesn't show very well up there. Well, it shows pretty good right here. So this is my grandson, Johnny. He just turned 16. And he said that if he stood in front of my Maserati... Would that mean that he would get it on his 16th birthday? 
And I said, no, but we will help you buy one for your 16th birthday. So that's him over on the right, and that's his car. We get to give a lot of cars away now. Is there another picture? That's my daughter, Ginger, in front of her car when she turned 40 a couple years ago. We bought her a car. On the right is Ginny's parents. Her dad has passed away now. Mom turns 90 next month. And this is a car a couple, two or three years ago we bought for them. I bought cars for my parents, all kinds of other things. My business partner and I helped start a ministry at church called the Cars Ministry. And so what that is, is I think John, my business partner, gave $50,000 and we gave a bunch of money and they started this new ministry at church. And so what they do is people donate their cars as they get older and they get a write-off from the church because they make a donation of their car because they have the money already saved up in cash to buy their next one. They don't have to leave it on the side of the road. They give it to the church. The church then has people that are really good at um, fixing up cars and they put new tires on it and they fix it up and they give it to single moms so they can get to work. And they give it to poor people in the area that, that just need a chance. That if they just had a car, they could get to work. They want to work. They don't, they don't want to, for people to pay their way. If they just had a car. In the first two years, we've given away 100 cars. What's really cool is we helped start another ministry called Rest Stop Ministries. And they actually, it's a ministry a friend of mine started. And we bought a house out in the country. And they get women off the streets that have been in sex slavery. Seriously. And they rescue them. And they bring them in. And they rehab them and fix them up. And then two or three years later, they're able to get on their feet and go out there and get a job. But they need a car. And so I'm at the gala. It's the yearly event of fundraising for Rest Stop Ministries. Didn't even realize how these things can intersect. And all of a sudden, we're having this big event for this graduate from Rest Stop Ministries that now is going to go into her own apartment and got a job and now has a car. And it showed a picture of her in front of a car up on the screen. And that car was donated by the Cars Ministry in our church. How cool is that? And that God lets me participate in some way in those kind of things. And it's all because when you realize you, when you begin to live in obedience and you realize that you want to spend as little on consumption and contingency as possible and fill up the charity the happiest people on earth, and I know we got a room full of them. It's not just me, and it's not just giving away cars, and please don't let that be a stumbling block. Here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about having a heart to give. And I bet we have a whole room full of people that you are like, I just want the ability to give. It may never be a car, but everyone can give something. And tomorrow, if you're in Yarmouth Wesleyan Church, if you go to another church, go to their church. And maybe you can listen to this online later. But I'm going to tell the story of my daughter up there. Who, though one day, if we don't give it all to charity first, will probably inherit a decent amount of money. Her and her husband just lived tough from, you know, they didn't have big careers with big jobs, and so they're like everybody else, just getting by, getting by, getting by. And I'm going to tell an amazing story of her heart in giving to everyone in here. You don't need any money to do it. If you have a heart to give and you begin giving the little bit that you have, there's a, there's a verse in the Bible that says, if you're faithful with a little, then you'll be faithful with much. God's looking for a room full of people that are willing to be givers and faithful with a little? I never knew. We never imagined or dreamed in a hundred years 
that not only would we be able to buy our own cars, but we could give away cars every year. And here's what's cool. There's someone here that, I don't know, maybe I can find it. Where's my uh, cell phone? So, uh, yeah, so there's somebody here. You went to Kingswood, right? So there's, I went to Kingswood. Anyone hear my, any of my talks at Kingswood, either that's a former student, Jason? Yeah, some of the people. So I gave that same thing. So Ryan Genero, is that how you pronounce his name? He's a pastor that went there. You know what he told me at Beulah Camp this summer that made my day? He said, Pete, I just bought my first car in my first job as a pastor, and I paid cash for my car. So you know what makes my day? Is when I get an email or a, a message from a guy like this. Um, see if anyone knows this guy. Uh, shoot, what's his name? Hang on. I'll find it. Oh, these make my day. So this guy, Daniel O'Connor. So <clears throat> I'm wondering if, although the drive was worth it, you know, coming to Yarmouth, is it really going to make a difference to anyone? Going to Kingswood, is it really going to make a difference in someone's life? So Daniel is listening in the crowd of Kingswood University students and this is his message to me. See if this is not, if you or me, worth more than millions of dollars. Mr. Benson, I am a former student from Kingswood University, and over the course of my time there, I heard your seminar on financial management three times. Boy, those people. I just wanted you to know that it has made a legitimate difference in the way I see money. I finished Kingswood, though, this year with $55,000 in student debt. I'm currently working at a Starbucks trying to figure out my next steps and land my first ministry job. I decided a couple of months ago that I was going to buy a car, and so I started looking for cars, financing options, personal bank loan options, etc., and I was fully intending to borrow money to buy a car. That was until God reminded me of everything you had said those years at Kingswood University. I already have 55000 in student debt. What sense does it make to go further into debt? Just, well, just ask everyone else. But just a little, for a little more freedom with transportation. So now, I buy a monthly bus pass for $77 a month. And I just started this month saving about $300 a month so I can buy my first car in cash and pay myself a car payment. My goal is to be debt-free of all my student debt in five to eight years if I am diligent on a pastor's salary. All this to say, thank you so much for taking the time to invest in us at Kingswood University. The seeds that you've sown have grown into a commitment for me and my family and the money that God entrusts me with that goes far beyond my own wants and desires. Plus, it's a lot easier to not be jealous of the cars I see on the road when I realize that the bank actually owns them in the first place. Thank you so much, Pete. I think that was a little dig there. It's made a huge difference in my life. God bless. If he can do it, everyone can do it. If I can do it, we can all do it. So what I'm here to say is... Cars and cards, cars and cards are the two biggest enemies to debt-free living. Cars and cards. If I was to add it up, all the hours that I've counseled people, all the things that I, all the conversations I've had, and Will Rogers said it well when he said, we're going to show the world that we're prosperous even if we have to go broke to do it. And I'm telling you, we need a bunch of fish that are willing to swim against the current, that dare to be different. You say, but Pete, that is weird. That's not normal. I'll tell you what normal is. Normal is broke. Normal is broke because they owe more than they're worth. How you figure that out is you add up assets over here in the left column, that's anything that you own, and over here, all your debts. And 90% of people in North America, the debts are more than their assets. 
That's how you know if you're broke. It's, a com- it's the most elementary financial principle that there is. The only way that you have any financial worth is if your assets are worth more than your debts. That's the way you know. So cards and cars. What's the next uh, slide? I love this cartoon. A credit card is what you use when you want to pay when something costs too much and you want to pay more for it. That's what they do. Now, there's a few of us who pay use a card, but for every one, there's 99 out of 100 that the card uses you. I use a card. You say, Pete, well, is it, is it sinful? Is it wrong for me to have a credit card? Well, here's, here's, here's how you figure it out. In the last five years, have you ever carried a balance? If the answer is no, you use a credit card. If the answer is yes, the credit card uses you. And in my opinion, but I could be wrong, you shouldn't have one. You say, that's my emergency fund. We're going to cover that. Don't worry, we'll get to that. And that's the worst emergency fund ever invented. Because it's an emergency fund that creates an emergency. It doesn't make it go away. An emergency fund is not meant to make your emergency worse than it is. It's to make it better. And so what do you do? Well, you start paying them off. And you start with the smallest one first. And the smallest one first, it doesn't matter what the interest payment is, it's you got to get a win under your belt. The second thing is, or maybe the first, you cut them up so you don't overuse them anymore. And at the same time, you've got to start working on the emergency fund, which we'll get to, Um, just before lunch. How much time do we have? Ten minutes. Don't give up on me. Is this any helpful? I know this is a hard part. Debt's the killer. And listen, I, I have great sympathy and empathy, and I'm with you, and life is hard, and it's tough. And nobody teaches you this stuff. And, and remember what I started with. I came to give you hope. Don't leave here and go to lunch and not come back because you don't have hope. There is a lot of hope. The fact that you're here, you're taking notes, you're learning You eat the elephant one bite at a time, and it's amazing what you can do. You can do a lot less in one year than you think you can, and you can do a lot more in five years than you ever imagined. And that's the problem. We get get too discouraged in the first one year. If If you will put the principles in mind for at least a year, you're golden. You're on your way. If you're not willing to give it that long, you weren't willing to try. But that's where most people give up. And a good friend, uh, well, a friend, I, I follow him on Twitter, John Acuff, A-C-U-F-F. He lives in the Nashville area. Hilarious. Uh, but anyway, he's written a book called Finish. And it's so good. And he talks about that. He says our goal, we, we set our goals too high. He said, whatever you think your goal should be, write that number down and then cut it in half and start with the half. That's your goal. Whether it's weight loss, whatever it is, we make our goals too high. We want to accomplish too much in too little time. And so we give up in the first year, usually in the first month. But if we make it a year, it's five years. So you got to cut that card up. You got to start paying them off. You know what's not fun? Paying for something today that lost its luster a year ago. That ought to teach us the whole time we're doing this that we're never going to let it happen again. So you got to cut them up, and then you got to start... I mean, seriously, if drastic measures are needed, you got to go to the cash system. And you got to start having envelopes for things and going that way. Because when you give a card... It doesn't seem like you're paying money. But when you reach in your wallet 
and you have cash and you give hand people money, it's like, oh, that, that's my money you're taking. But when it's a card, how many of you have ever handed a debit or a credit card over and signed for it, left, and was like, what did that even cost? If someone quizzed you in the parking lot, nine out of ten times, you wouldn't remember. Because it doesn't seem like money. So you've got to get radical. You've got to do a plasectomy on your cards. And at the same time, you've got to start creating an emergency fund so that they don't get sucked into creating another one. And then you got, I mean, so all these things work in tandem together. Now you're beginning to see when I said that work, that word work and time, it takes work and time. And you know what? It's daily. It's every day. It's every day living by your budget, tracking. I didn't even get into tracking. If you're only going to do a budget, but you're not going to track your expenses, don't do a budget. It's a useless waste of time. A tracking is, okay, so they had these things. Um, what's your local little convenience store? Is it, um, well, it's not little, Walmart or something? That you go and see that, that's an that's a iPhone. They have these little booklets, and over the left-hand side, there's this little wire circle thing, like a notebook thing but it's small, and it fits right in your pocket. You know what's helped us through those early years to really live with guardrails on is she would carry one, and I would carry one, and we would, whatever month it was in, so we're going to start November, on each page, we'd, this is what we did in our family business meeting. It's really elaborate, so sophisticated, we would turn a page and put the number one on it. That meant the first day of the month. Then we'd turn the next page and put number two. Then all the way up to 30 or 31 days, whatever it was, and that was our month, and we had to, every person in the family that spends money had to carry one of these with them every day. And when you stop at Tim Hortons like we did this morning, and I got oatmeal, and we got coffee, and we see what that bill was, we'd open it up, What's today? The 20th or something? What is it? 20th. 20th? And we'd write down $9.45. Turn the page. Tomorrow, so on. We'd do that. And at the end of the month, we'd add all those up and it would tell us. And as Christy said, people say, Where does my money go? That little book, it tells you. Some of you won't do it because you don't want to know. This thing is evil. It's evil. But evil can be good when it gives you financial freedom. And that's what you do. So you got to have a budget. You cut up the cards. You start living within your means. You start, you start making decisions. And then you start having those family meetings and all those. And then let's go to this next one. We got, if we even have five minutes, I'm going to create. What's the next? Uh, okay, so you can either play now. And you get to pay later. Oh, that's no fun. Or you can pay now, but you get to play later. We paid on the front end for 20 years. We, we paid, and now we're playing. In life, you'll experience one of two pains. Either the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. Too many of us live in the pain of regret. But I'm telling you, having financial freedom, it takes discipline. Next page. Okay, so I'm just going to hit this real quick because there's not a lot to say here. Create an emergency fund. Emergencies will always, always, always happen. They will. Stuff happens down our way. Air conditioners go out. Transmission goes in the car. Water line breaks. Somebody needs some kind of surgery. Even if we have health insurance down there, you can write a $2,500 check just for your share. 
Stuff happens. You've got to have a fund to get you out of those situations that you didn't expect. And getting to yourself where at least 5% of your income can go to that. It's going to get spent. But at least this way, you don't have to pay more than what the actual cost was. Because now you pay out of your money and you don't have to pay interest on top of it. So that's like an emergency on top of the emergency if you have to have a card for it. So all I'm going to tell you is the emergency fund is not the Christmas fund. It's not your retirement fund. It's not any of those funds. It's an emergency fund. Open an account and keep it totally separate and hands off. Guys, it's not for a new gun for hunting. That's not an emergency. You've got to have it for emergencies because enough of them will happen. So Proverbs 21, 20, the wise man saves for the future, but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. Is there a slide under this or no? Yeah, right there. So this is the good old U.S., do not aspire to be like the U.S. From 1970, this is people's savings rates that used to be in the 10 to 12% rate back when we almost lost our country financially in 2008. You can see it went way down to two. This is the savings rate. That's not the rate that you get on your savings. That's the amount of people's income that they actually saved. Now, that's including... Retirement, emergency, and every kind of saving. And now in 2018, it's 3%. It's not enough. You need 10% for retirement and 5% for, for emergencies. This is heading for trouble. We as a country in the U.S. have never been in a worse situation as far as Massive amounts of debt that we owe as a country, 21 trillion. Canada is not great per capita. And then citizens for mortgage and every other kind of thing. And then, so you, you want to create the perfect storm? High debt, low savings. It needs to be low debt, high savings, and you'll rule the world. Seriously. You want to be Santa Claus to everybody? Get yourself in a financial position where every day and every week you have more money than you need to pay bills and you get to bless people's lives. It is the coolest thing in the world. And I don't deserve it. And I'm not better than anyone else. But we get to do this all the time. And I'm like, God, why me other than, this isn't to boast, but to share with people where you can go from the lowest of hopelessness to the highest of hopeful. With God and the right answers, all that can be possible. Not on the same scale as everyone. We're not Warren Buffett. No matter where you're at, there's lots of people who have more and there's lots of people who have less. But it's getting yourself in a place where there's margin. M-A-R-G-I-N. Margin. And what's really cool is, and I'll tell this, and it's lunchtime, right? Don't, don't quit yet. What's the gal's name who, who is babysitting for Dan and Mandy? Marie. So last Sunday after church, after having company for like five days, my wife and I were ready for a good afternoon leisurely rest. And all of a sudden the phone rings and it's our son and they're going to go to a Titans football game. I don't know why. All they do is lose if you've ever heard of them. They're not like the Predators who are good, but the Titans is a football. They're going to the football game and they had a babysitter driving over and they called and said it was really raining heavy and her car just kind of, um, it wasn't really a big accident or anything, but it just kind of slid off of the road 
and she's got to get a tow truck to come get her uh, car out. Could we keep their little girl, Imogen? Don't you love that name? Imogen Rose. You think you have the best grandchildren. You have no idea. <laughs> Imogen Rose is going to come over. So as much as like, oh, oh, he's looking forward to her rest. We get to keep Imogen for uh, uh, until this gal. And so anyway, she's got our cell phone number. We got hers. And so Bree, I've never met her before. Young girl, got her car, poor thing. You know, that's embarrassing and it's tough. She's going to babysit. You know, she's going to make a lot of money babysitting for a few hours. And she rolls off into the ditch. Now she's got to call a tow truck to come get her. But she was in amazing spirits. And she says, I'm going to get there as soon as I can. I want to come keep Imogen and so on. It's about an hour and a half later or something. She shows up at our house. So I knew she was coming to the house to pick up Imogen. Never met her before in our life. And I go into our bedroom, and in the sock drawer, it's a sock and money drawer. And so I pulled out a $100 bill, and I met Bree at the door. Well, I gave it to Jenny first. And, and uh, I said, when she, when she comes in, before she leaves, let's tell her that we want to help her with her towing. And so she picks up Imogen, and she's had a hard day. And things didn't work out. She's probably now going to owe more in towing than she'd make babysitting. And she has the most amazing spirit and great personality and, and outlook and whatever. And at least there was no damage to the bottom of our car and everything. And, and she's got Imogen. And Jenny says, oh, just one more thing. And she starts to hand her the money. And she sees that it's a $100 bill. And literally, I could die now. Because the look on her face, oh, 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 I can't do that. Oh, yeah. We just, we've been blessed. And we just feel like we want to bless you. Thank you for keeping our grandchild. And here's $100. Oh, no, I can't do it. So she goes, she takes Imogen finally. She does take the money. She goes back to the house. It's about 15 minutes away. The next thing, she has texted our daughter-in-law, Mandy, and our son, Dan. And she's told them this wild story about this crazy couple she'd never met before, and they gave her a $100 bill. What should she do? And they said, yep, that's what they do, and you just keep it. And so then she texts Jenny back with the most amazing text of thanks. You know what? Maybe I'm selfish. I, I love living that dream. I do. I have to admit, I love the high that that gives me. I came to Canada at a particular time, not for the high that you now have legal here. <laughs> but do you know who the happiest people are on Christmas Eve? Is it the kids or the parents? Absolutely. I couldn't even get to sleep at night when I was, had young kids at home because I couldn't wait for Christmas morning for them to see not what I got, but what I gave. And I'm, te- I'm saying all this to only say that the best part is the, is the end. Got to come back after lunch. But I'm saying all this to say that some of us are bound up in chains. And we're like, I want to be that guy. I want to be that girl. And we're nothing special. We are nothing special. You have as much or probably way more giving bones in your body than I do. But it doesn't make sense to give a bunch of money more away when you're already tangled up in your own. You're just going to sink deeper. But if you need a motivation... To get out from underneath that. And it could take three years, five years, ten years, fifteen years. But it's worth the wait. To get there where you can live in that kind of freedom. Where it's not what you get for yourself anymore. It's what you give to others. And you can't get there if you're all tied up. So the best part is after lunch.
But let's go do lunch. Christy, here she comes. Sorry I went over. <laughs> 